welcome back. My name is Adrian. This is To Teach One. My name is Aaron. My name is Doris. And uh, on the agenda today, uh, we're going to have a pretty, you know, it's kind of a little bit of a heavier topic, a but, uh, yeah. you know, that sometimes that's the, that's the stuff that we need to talk about. That's the meat. But real quick, before we get into that, let's do a little recap. So where were we at last week? Uh, what did we speak about? Well, we talked about New Year's resolutions and how to put your best foot forward, right? So, you know, you, you start off with a lot of steam and you're headed Zeal. towards that goal, right? Zest. And for that first month, you know, you're, you're eating good and, and you're pumping iron and, and you're just really trying. Maybe as you get into February, you slow down a little bit. Yeah, man. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a tough thing to do, you know, to change habits and it takes time. Absolutely, you know, yeah. Because cause just about anyone can do anything, you know, even if they don't like it for a short period of time. Right. It's sticking to it that, you know, is the trick. So um, so that discussion was really fruitful. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people have given us some pretty good feedback yes, about that. Thank you very much. And we're very, very thankful. You know, um, one of the things we definitely would encourage everyone to do is to comment, um, you know, subscribe, follow us. Uh, we're currently on the Podbean app. Uh, soon we should be on iTunes and uh, we let everyone know uh, through our social media profiles uh, when you can, you know, find us on uh, many other pl- platforms. Uh, we've learned a lot about how to, you know, go about this whole process of uh, getting our the word out there. Um, and, you know, we, we continue to learn. So last week we spoke about uh, nutrition, physical activity and self-care, three components that are really important if you're going to uh, really get the found, you know, set a good foundation, you know, yeah. for you know the new year, you know, if uh, if Ex- I, if a healthier lifestyle is something exactly. you're looking to do, right? Yes, go- that's what I was waiting. That's the magic word, lifestyle. Right. Oh yeah, 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 yes. for sure. A lot of uh, diseases and uh, things that uh, cause us to regress are directly linked to our everyday lives what we do on a daily basis that's right yeah yeah totally and you know if you think about it as a temporary thing like if if you think to yourself well i'm gonna work out and get this goal and i'm gonna not eat this thing and and achieve this weight those are temporary things that's not a lifestyle yeah that's true and you're not gonna stick with that if you Mm. just think you know what i want to be healthier in 2019 and this is how i get there like there's no goal as far as i want to weigh this weight and i want to do that i mean those things are are good to have, but realize that ultimately you're not going to stick with it unless it becomes a lifestyle, like you were saying. Exactly. Yeah, true. And you know what? Uh, you know, we're just like everyone else. You know, we're trying to make these changes. Uh, mm-hmm. I, a lot of the time, these topics that we come up with, uh, you know, very, you know, they come about very organically. It's stuff that we're trying to figure out for ourselves. You know, things that we've gone through. Yes. You know that we, we you know, we're looking for answers. How are we going to get this done? So, you know, if you're interested in something like that, we guarantee that uh, we had a pretty good discussion. It was fun. So mm-hmm. uh, please check us out at to, to teach com. That's number two, T-E-A-C-H, number one, dot com. Uh, you can find our so- social media profiles on there. Uh, you can find us uh, across the board, um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, <clears throat> and Twitter at T-W-O-T-E-A-C-H-O-N-E. Um, and uh, yeah, please check us out, comment, let us know what you're thinking, join the discussion, and uh, we'd love to have you. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on. Let's do it. Let's do it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. <sighs> Deep breath. Right. It's a, it's a weighty issue we're tackling. Yeah. This, is, uh, th- this, this one was definitely, you know, tougher, you know, but I think it's, it's been a good process, you know. Um, to go through, you know, for some of us, for I think all of us, you know, to some degree, we didn't necessarily, um, we haven't addressed this topic as we are going to address it today, you know, until now. Correct. And, uh, That's correct. You know, we're really hoping that, you know, someone else will hear this, you know, and benefit from it, you know, because uh, we, all, we all go through stuff like this. Uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things you can't really avoid. Health issues such as cancer such as major illness, are things that nobody really wants to talk about. Everybody wants to assume it's not going to happen to me, it's not going to happen to my family. But the numbers, the statistics show 
that most people will be faced with either themselves or a very close loved one that will have to deal with cancer at some point in their life. Right, right. And so, you know, the topic for this week is cancer from our perspective. You know, to be more clear, you know, we're just going to talk about, um, since all of us have had someone, you know, near and dear to us that's gone through uh, the process of, you know, being diagnosed and, you know, seeking treatment um, for the disease that's cancer, um, you know, we want to tell our stories, you know, what was it like, you know, how did we experience it? Because just like with, you know, other things in life, right, they talk about, you know, things like, you know, when someone, say, is uh, addicted to drugs, okay, it's not just them going through that process, because their uh, loved ones definitely, um, you know, go through a journey of their own, Yes. you know, because they love you, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, they don't just love one part of you. Well, sometimes they do, but you know, yeah, more often than not, it's uh, the whole package. It's, it's the whole, the whole package. Yeah, package. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that even a word? Uh, uh, we. Oui. Oh, you don't speak French. <laughs> 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 you know what? Please don't hate me yeah. <laughs> for that one. So, um, so yeah. No, 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 no. Package. <laughs> package. <laughs> Okay, you know je m'appelle Aaron. <laughs> you know, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, je m'appelle Adrien. Ah, uh, oui. Uh, it's, it, we, we, have, we have reached the sum total of my French knowledge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should have seen the face Adrian made just to get that, those words out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, oh. My, uh, my French teacher, Mr. Ndu, would oh, be man. just ashamed. I know. I took uh, four semesters of French in college, and I know. You're kidding me. No. Yeah, yeah, whatever, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know I did. I just don't remember any of it. Oh, you're kidding me. You actually did? No, I, I really took. Oh, I mean, man. ask me how many of them I passed. Ah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, but you know, testing is, uh, who cares? Uh, yeah, right. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so cancer from our perspective. So, I mean, I'll go first. You know, okay. and I'll just kind of talk about, you know, what I experienced. Um, you know, th- the goal is just for someone else to be able to. You know, identify with some of the things that I may talk about. Um, I'm definitely not the only one. Um, so, I mean, for me, really, the the most the more difficult part about you know this this journey that I took was being away, and that's the perspective that I'm coming from. You know, because I mean, had I, you know, if I could, you know, had a time machine, I'd love to be able to go back and change things because mm-hmm. I'd, I would have loved to be there. Yeah. You know, regardless of what's happening, I would have liked to be there, you know, but like you were talking about earlier, it's not like, you know, we know these things are going to happen. You know, I was just working, doing my thing, you know, Netflix, you know, the, you know, nine to five, you know, type deal. Then, you know, out of nowhere, here comes, you know, some news. Right. And so, you know, I live and work here in the United States. You know, I was born in, in Africa, in Kenya, and... That's where, I mean, most of our family members, you know, still are. And uh, when I heard about my grandpa's, you know, illness, um, first of all, I mean, the emotions that I was going through in the beginning were, you know, those of, I mean, mixed emotions, like a lot of people, you know, you know, go through, I'm sure. You know, we've talked about this very briefly in the past, but, you know, immediately one of the things that I experienced was, you know, feelings of, 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 of anger mostly at the time you know directed towards my my dearest mother because um while i understand her reasons for you know why she was doing that you know i don't necessarily you know agree what was she doing well i'm getting there okay so 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 what happened was i mean i was just doing my thing and it got to a point where we were preparing uh where i didn't know this but um, I was about to receive the news that we're preparing to try and, you know, uh, go back home to Africa to see my grand- grandfather because he wasn't quite, you know, he wasn't doing well. Yeah. Um, what I didn't know at the point at that time was that, you know, he had actually been ill. I don't know if it, I don't think it was quite a year, but it was definitely months. It had been months since uh, um, everyone else. I'm not sure who everyone else even was, but and I'm sure his, you know, his children um, you know, my, you know, my aunts and uncles and my mother, you know, had found out about, uh, you know, his diagnosis. And so I remember one, we- you know, it was a weekend, 
like you know as usual i was uh at my mother's house chilling with the dog you know as i usually do and you know got the news from mom she said you know um your grandfather is uh, not doing well and uh you know he was diagnosed with cancer you know and and this is what's you know happening and you know we need to prepare to go and you know to see him now i did of course at that point you know hind- in hindsight i didn't quite know how serious things were but i mean once you hear you know cancer i mean it's it's serious enough yeah you know at this point obviously i know that that was the beginning and things hadn't developed in the way that were they were going to but yeah, I was I was really I was I was really mad because I felt that I was robbed of the choice to make my own decision about, you know, how I'm going to, you know, feel about it or, you know, it, or wh- or any, or whatever it is. My mother's reason was one of a, a protective mother. Sure. You know, that's where she was coming from. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, I just felt like, you know, I didn't ask for protection. And, I'm, you know, at this point, I'm already in my 30s. Yeah. So, you know, I'm a grown man, right. you know. Um, and this, this is, some, we're talking about someone who was not just like, you know, my grandfather. But as you described in the last episode. Right? Yeah, as I described. Or, my, it was the first one. In, as I described in the, fr- in the first episode, yeah. which was, uh, you know, talking about the reasons why we're doing this. And my grandfather is the inspiration for, you know, starting a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, he was my friend. Yeah. You know, we were just, you know, thick as thieves. And we did all everything together. And uh, it's it's a, it's a saying. What is thick as thieves? Close. I know. Yeah. It means close. Yeah. Yeah, very close. How thieves sit and scheme. Well, yeah. And yeah, plot. Yeah. yeah, yeah kind and of. you need to be pretty close to go rob a bank together. Th- that's true. You have to trust. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. we were close. Yeah. And so that was the first, that was the first, you know, emotion that I experienced, you know, in, in a very big way. And that may have also been because in the years leading up to finding out about my grandfather's illness, uh, what had happened was, and I think my mother will speak a little bit about this, but uh, we were celebrating their uh, 50, 50th uh, year anniversary um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a married couple, you know, so him and my grandma had been together 50 years. Wow. I was invited Mm-hmm. Not just invited, but my grandpa had asked me to be his best man. Oh wow! Yes. And wow. that would have been that was the first time I'd ever been asked to be, you know, a best man. Now the thing is, I was going through a particular time in my life that actually, I mean, that was like the eye of the storm. Really, that was very close to you know, around the time when I decided to make some changes. But it was it was it was in a, a very 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 dark time in my life. Mm-hmm. And so while I wanted to go. I just wasn't able to get everything I needed to get done in time to be able to go because my priorities were, you know, completely misplaced. Uh, yeah, I, you know? I understand. Having yeah, been exactly. There myself. Yeah, you know, and you know, um, we'll, you know, what was going on at that time will be a discussion for another time. You know, but uh, f- for the sake of this discussion, let's just say that you know I was dealing with some some definite guilt from not being able to be there for my grandfather then. And then to find out that, you know, he's, he's experiencing uh, something like, you know, being diagnosed with cancer, you know, without me being there, it was hard. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, it's not like he didn't have support, you know, my, my aunt, you know, my uncle, you know, the family was there. And, uh, you know, in Africa, we really take this, you know, it takes a village thing seriously. Especially in our family, you know, the, uh, it, it was it was I was surprised, you know, to find out that there's some families, you know, where there isn't a lot of love, hmm. you know, because all I know is being in a family that where there's a lot of love, yeah, you know, like and so and. yeah, and and that's just how we roll, you know. People yeah. are always at the house, you know, for birthdays and mm-hmm. you know this and that, and you know they just stop in and that's how that's that's the culture over there. Yeah. So it, you know, I took I took I, it was definitely comforting to know that that was you know. That was happening, and that you know, th- you know, he definitely wasn't alone. I mean, and you know, besides the family being there, I mean, my grandma and him had been together for, I mean, like I said, fifty years. Yeah, for a long time. And when I say together, I mean, I don't know, I don't know of many things they did apart. I mean, that's I, true. <laughs> I mean, I I remember one time, you know, looking at my grandma and going, you know, if I can have a fraction of what you guys have. 
Yeah. Like I'd be lucky, you know, because of just seeing this bond, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, we're talking about they wake up in the morning and they make their bed together. They, you know, they kneel down, say their prayers. My grandpa gets up and, you know, he had his little workout regimen that he did, you know, at the end of the bed. Uh, Some sort it was of a tai routine. Chi, yeah. Oh, neat. When I think it, it was, about it. It was, it was, you know, well, it was like African, Af- African, African chi. chi. <laughs> <laughs> African chi. African chi. Yeah. <laughs> Kenya chi. Kenya chi. That sounds like a martial <laughs> art. Kenya, Kenya chi. Welcome to Kenya G. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that, that movie's coming out next summer. Look out for it. <laughs> the movie that didn't make it to the theater. <laughs> hey, man, we're in talks, you know. <laughs> anyway, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, I'm just oh, joking. Goodness. You know, but um, it really was, you know, comforting to know that, you know, the rest of the family was there. And the more I think about it, I mean... We, it was there was there was a lot of emotions of uh you know just benevolence you know mm. i mean and, and, and the the roller co- the emotional roller coaster kind of became my home uh because like i said we we're getting ready to go and visit my grandpa right, right so yeah. you know without knowing really what's going on um and you know i'm pretty sure my mother can attest to this you know he had such a positive like outlook on things yeah, and I have also. I mean, because I hung, hung out with him so much, especially the person I am today. You know, I'm not looking to like you know put too much stock into what the problem is. I'm more looking you know positively towards the solution. Yeah, and uh, you know, I see him being you know in that in the, in that frame of mind, and so you know, I was I was in this space where I was like, okay, you know what, everything's everything's gonna be okay. You know, getting a, a cancer diagnosis is not damning. Yeah, no. Okay. Especially it, today. Especially today. You know, yeah. there's so many advancements, right? I was looking forward to going back home, you know, to see him for myself. Um, you know, and when when I get when I finally got there, it was uh I don't think I had any expectations of what to really expect, you know, to to see or to experience. Um, but it I was really relieved to see I think all the way through, honestly, all the way through from from that time all the way to the end. One of the, the the best things I can say I experienced with him was, you know, the fact that his, his he, there was such a, like, you know, his spirit was not really that broken. Like, he, did, he didn't really change until the very, very end. I don't, you know, I don't think he changed. It, the disease didn't change who he was. You know, it may have changed a lot of things about how he operated, you know, and, and moved and, you know, those kind of things. But I remember, you know, people coming from the church because he was a church elder and uh, they'd have like, you know, documents. I'm talking like constantly. That's that's how it was. You know, I, you know, I go there, I see my grandpa, you know, he's, he's, he's doing some of the, you know, same things he's always done, mm-hmm. you know, working for the church. And, I, I be, you know, I hear he did that all the way to the end. And I'm not sure, but even to this day, I don't know if they've actually elected or someone else someone else to take mm. his spot. But so when I got there, this is what I this is what I saw. I saw, oh, I was like, oh man, okay, cool. Yeah. So things aren't like you know crazy or like you know not that I had expectations, but I was uh, I was pleased. First of all, I was just pleased to be there because uh, once again I got to be with my friend. You know, we're gonna hang out, watch some wrestling, right? You know, as usual. And and at the time, I mean, I don't think he was even at that point. I don't think he was like really eating like you know sweets and stuff like that. There were definitely some dietary changes that had you know taken place, but he was still eating. You know, so when meal times came, um, sometimes his schedule was a little bit different. But you know, we often sat and uh, ate at the same time. You know, it's pretty much like nothing had happened. Like yes. we hadn't spent that much time away from each other. Right. You know. So that was very good, you know, to to experience. And just, you know, the whole vibe of being back home and seeing, you know, all the relatives coming by and the friends, you know, and, and all of this, all, all of these, uh, all this, all this activity around really made me feel um, not so hopeless. Right. Positive. Yeah. I had, I had a pretty positive outlook on, you know, the future. Um, and. There was no reason, there was absolutely no reason, you know, not to at that point, at mm-hmm. least from my perspective. At that point, it started dawning upon me. I mean, the, and there was other things going on in my life. Um, it wasn't just the fact that I went and, you know, saw my grandfather. 
Um, I also, for the first time, because mind you, I hadn't been back home in 12 years. Mm. So I was seeing my grandfather for the first time after 12 years. Wow. You know, so that was also, I mean, talk about overwhelmed. I'm going back home for the first time after 12 years. You know, we're going to see my grandfather who's been diagnosed to, you know, with uh, esophageal cancer. And uh, on the other hand, I'm also, I'm also trying to figure out how to, you know, kind of uh, digest this whole, I'm meeting my siblings for the first time. Because, you know, my dad had some, you know, kids after me. I was, a lo- I was the only one for the longest time. And, uh, you know, now, I, now in total there's seven of us. Wow. Yeah. Okay. As my father says, you know, you can call him Father Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, and you and had never met them until then. I, no, well, I had not met. So th- when I went that time, I didn't get to meet my, um, my sister. Um, I, won't, I don't know if she'd mind if I mention her name. Um, my sister Mshai, she's she's my stepsister, but you know I mean, that doesn't yeah, really no, matter, you know. But I had I didn't meet her that time because mm. she, you know, she went okay. to boarding school like I did, oh, uh, okay. you know, when I was in high school. Um, but I met, you know, my sister, <laughs> my little sisters. Yeah, and, the and ones. I believe, mom, was it? Uh, was that around the time? The first time I went, was it? Was that when uh, my brothers were born? It was. Yes, it, it was, was actually. So, uh, so my twin Little brothers, they had going just on. been my born. Twi- they had just been born. I'm talking like days. Wow. Yes. When wow. I landed, you know. So I mean, there was so much, and and you can imagine, right? So there's all these mixed emotions, you know. So I'm trying to deal with, you know, figuring out how to be supportive for my grandpa, you know, while I'm there, and you know, but not letting that, like, you know, kind of overrun my whole purpose for being there. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, so, yeah. so, so I'm not trying to be there, like, you know, crying and stuff, you know. Sure. I'm yeah. like, yo, this is cool. I get to be with my grandpa. Any yeah. time spent is, you know, good time, you know, spent. You know, time well spent. So so there's that going on. And then I go and I have to meet, you know, I meet my siblings. Yeah. And, you know, oh my, it, it was, there was so much going on. Sounds just like excitement it. and, and, mm. and, 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 you know, just highs and lows and everything yeah. in between, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, and then, of course, after 12 years, then there's your f- friends you grew up with, man. You know, like the oh, homies sure. from the hood, you know. <laughs> I mean, there's so much going on. Mm-hmm. And uh, so needless to say, it was, it, was a very, it was a very interesting time. And all that, all the, what really happened in that time is it made me feel like I wanted to just drop everything and move back home. Mm. That's what I wanted to do. Yes, I can relate to that. You know? My grandpa did a really great, great job raising me because I felt that way, but I knew enough because of the person I had become that you're not supposed to be, you know, being impulsive isn't always, you know, the thing to do. No. And so I took some time, you know, I went, I went to Kenya, I came back to the States and I really started thinking about, okay, fine. So I'm more aware of what the situation is. so, So what now? And the more I thought about it, it was more important for for me and i believe and i believe and still believe you know to this day even though we didn't really talk about it that it would it, my grandpa's wish for me would be to continue to grow and work into you know the person that i um i was becoming yes because that would serve all purposes mm-hmm. okay because i can just up and leave and go back to kenya and you know, and be there and spend time, which would have been a a great honor because the most valuable resource that we have is time. You can't get any more. Agreed. You know, so I would have, I would have done that gladly. Um, But that I didn't, I didn't really think that that's what he would have wanted, you know? So I stayed here. I worked. I stayed in communication as much as I could. And, you know, I made money and I sent money home, you know, and, and to sub- be supportive in that way. And when it comes to time, I made all the efforts possible to go back home as often as I could, which the truth is many people weren't able to do as many trips as I could mm-hmm. for as long as I could. Mm-hmm. Um, in a very weird way, everything happened at a time that was, that w- it worked. Right. 
you know, I mean, and, and that's just, you know, without, without really trying to, you know, dodge, you know, the truth that, I mean, if I was in a different place working, you know, if I, was, if I wasn't where, where I was at, at at that point in my life, I wouldn't have been able to do the things that I did, mm. you know, um, you know, sending money home to take care of my grandfather, you know, because I couldn't give the time. So I give some money, mm-hmm. um, which went to great use. You know, being able to take that much time off, that, you know, was a true blessing. And and I have to be honest, you know, that was I was that was facilitated by the people I worked with directly, mm-hmm. um, which, as you know, is includes you. Yeah. You know, this very last time when I went to lay my grandpa to rest, you guys, you know, held down the fort while I was away. And, uh, you know, my employers were also very supportive of this. Yeah, it's a great place that we work at. Absolutely. Um, you know, just like any other family, things are not perfect, but, uh, you know, we, we do what we can and, uh, and we're there for each other, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm very appreciative, you know, for that. So, yeah, so, I mean, everything worked as well as it could. And I spent as much time as I could. I think for every year I was there, I went at least once a year for a month. Yeah, I, re- I remember that because when we, when I first started, you went for a month and then the next year you got to go, I mean, it was you know, for a, a, for a different purpose, but you also got yeah, to go for Yeah, right, work. right. And so, you know, how, you know, honestly, the way I feel about the whole thing is, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't for me or anyone else to decide, you know, how things played out. Mm-mm. I remember one time I was, uh, I was, I was praying and uh, I think my mom had told me that he was in the hospital and things were not good because I, I think it was after the, some of the treatments, you know, uh, your immunity goes down quite a bit. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you have to be very careful when you're in that phase because the smallest thing, mm-hmm. you know, can set you off and you can get, like, the, the simplest, you know, ailment can, can kill you. Like, a, you know, a little virus or whatever it is, yes. you know, things, it, you know, you're just not ready to fight anything off. And so she had told me that, you know, hey, you know, the, your grandpa's not doing, you know, re- right now he's not doing too well. And he's in the hospital. And that's when I knew things were more serious. When he was actually in the hospital, that's when things were more serious. Because he was always ailing since he got diagnosed. But once he was in the hospital overnight, you know, now we're talking about something more significant. Yes. And so I remember, you know, when she told me about that and, you know, I was just thinking about it and I was like, ah, you know, it's not up to me. And I was just, I, I remember praying and I said, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's his time, you know, and his and his work here is done because God knows, man. You know, he's done a lot. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, yes, he has. Let me tell you something, man. If you, unfortunately, sometimes we don't know until the end. Mm. But if you saw the number of people that showed up to his funeral, it was it was staggering. And the thing is, you you don't you're not in contact with all those people every day. No, you know, prior yeah. to the, something like that mm-hmm. happening. Mm-hmm. So you don't quite get the scope, like, you know, the the full picture of how much you're loved, you know, celebrated and revered, you know, and respected, really, and loved. Yes. It's respect and love. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, because of, you know, the body of his work and the people he's touched, you know. And, and it's not just him. It's, like I said, him and my grandma were mm-hmm. together all the time. Yeah. So it's them, Yeah. You know, there together. Was a, yeah, there was a lot of people, even you'd think uh, most of them, were old people no. no there was young people who are there because uh their parents right exactly yeah because they oh, absolutely and i knew mm-hmm. some of them yes you know so, some of those people some of those young people yes yeah. had gone to school with us and uh they knew him and they just had to show up i remember i arrived a uh, day before no the night before the funeral i arrived around 11 p.m I landed in Nairobi, and uh, the funeral was the next day at 9 o'clock in the morning. On my flight, I sat, I sat next to a couple, and uh, we got talking, and they realized that they knew him. I said, oh, I'm coming home to bury my father. And they said, oh, what's his name? And I said, Mr. Githere. And they said, are you serious? They said, our son lives in one of his apartments. Oh, what time is the funeral? I said, we'll be at the, at the funeral home at 9 a.m. and at the church at 11 a.m. They said, we'll be there. We cannot miss that funeral. 
Wow. Yeah, man. I mean, it, it was. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I mean, I I knew of his, you know, capacity to love, you know, and so it wasn't. I wasn't like, oh my god, I, I'm so surprised. I was just like, wow, you know, it's uh, yeah. it's 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 something different to see it, mm-hmm. you know, like physically, like mm-hmm. the amount of people and yeah. and and just the everyone that came out, you know, to show their support. You know, some people just. Um, you know, found out that maybe even that morning they opened up the newspaper and there was an announcement that, you know, the funeral was happening. And you could tell that they found out suddenly because they just walked from maybe wherever they were at and they showed up. Right. You know, so, uh, you know, I can I can go on and on about, you know, what that whole experience was was, was like. Um, you know, I think the important thing to for me to say is that, so he passed, you know, last year in December. Mm-hmm. And as hard as it is to, you know, continue to live and try and build on, you know, his legacy and that kind of thing, you know, without him there to, 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 to guide. Yes. Um, it's, it's going to be a very difficult thing. But in the end, I'm just thankful for having had uh, someone like him, you know, around. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people don't. That's right. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who don't have someone like that. I can go on knowing that, you know, everything I had, you know, during our time together was uh, was definitely, you know, it made me the person I am today. Yeah. And, you know, and he continued to live. He continues to live, you know, because of us, yeah. you know, in our minds, Good in our hearts, yeah. you know, in, in the way we do things. Mm-hmm. You know, for example, when we were at the funeral, at some point there was, uh, there was a point where we, uh, the bishop, the bishop showed up to his funeral. And uh, I went up to the altar and we were surrounding my grandfather's casket, you know, the family. And he, <laughs> he comes up from behind and he taps me on the shoulder and he goes, are you one of the children? And I was like, no, I'm his, uh, I'm his oldest grandson. And he goes, well, I, I can see him in you, you know. And, uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah. You know, that was pretty cool. That just meant you've got style. You know, that's probably what he was referring to more specifically. Because it's not like he really knows me, but. Still, it meant something to it, you. It, it, meant, it meant something to me, yeah. for sure. And it's interesting sure. how, you know, things that people say or, or do can have a lot more meaning than they know, especially in times like that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I definitely got that aspect, you know, you know, from him, you know. Um, so anyway, in closing, I'll just say that uh, I'm glad because I feel that we're both at peace, you know, wherever he as we know, when he transitioned to the other side, you know, and as I continue, I feel that we're both at peace. Mm, you know, good. I never yeah. got to have that discussion with him, but I just feel that that is, you know, how he felt and where mm-hmm. he was at. And, 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 I, and, and I'm at peace because I did absolutely everything that I could. Yes. You know, and if it wasn't for him, some of the changes I've made in my life wouldn't have been possible because, you know, a lot of the values and uh, some of my core beliefs have really shaped, you know, who I am. And, you know, the reason why I was willing to, you know, fight to, you know, regain some kind of sem- semblance of uh, no, I a understand. life that makes sense. You know, yeah, even <laughs> when you had strayed from them temporarily, they yeah. were still there. Oh, absolutely. And it was still guiding you in some way. Yeah. Um, you know, kind of like the prodigal son. Absolutely. You know? I mean, it was still there. The rock was still there. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, it was a lifestyle, really. You yeah. know, it's not like we sat down and it was, you know, a classroom type thing. No. You learned. You learned I was his driver, man. Yeah. Like, we, we rolled together, yeah. man, heavy. But, <laughs> but you learned so much more from people when they, by how they live, than, than anything that they yeah, can exactly. truly you know, teach you as far as just telling you He things. was a leader. Yeah. You know, he was a leader. And, uh, you know, I know we work together, mm-hmm. you know. I, I, I just want you to know, you know, and, you know, if anyone else that I work with, you know, you know, listens to this, you know, I definitely try and, you know, work, work to, you know, build myself as a leader. You, you, know, you are a very effective leader. I just, that's, that's what I, that's what I aim for, you yeah. know. And you do it by, just like your grandfather did, mainly by how you are and what you do. I mean, it's one thing, you know, anybody could, can direct and say, you should do this and you should do that. And I'm going to go sit on the couch over here. But when you see somebody in a position of authority, 
uh, not you know nominally, even though you don't really talk about it a lot. When you see somebody working harder than you, doing yeah. doing doing what needs to be done, you just learn like, oh, okay, that's that's the way we do it because it works, as opposed to just being told go do that. Yeah, leading by example, there is the, no better way. Yeah, it's the only way. It's the, the only way you can effective truly effective way. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Um, and and you know what? I think I think people are more receptive, you know, of it in that when it when it comes mm-hmm. that way. Oh yeah. You know, so, so you know, that's my story. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm very glad that I, you know, got to, you know, talk about this, because, uh, you know, the th- crazy thing about, you know, when someone like a loved one, you know, passes or something like that, it's, you don't like immediately. It's, <laughs> the grieving process, you know, takes time. Yes. You don't get to mm-hmm. to heal immediately no. or to process. Mm-mm. You no, know, really don't. I was I was in the gym like you know mid rep when I got a call. Yeah. You know, seriously, you know, I was doing <laughs> I was doing dumbbell incline press. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and I get a call, <laughs> and uh, no, I'll never. Uh, I can be so specific about how and what happened that day. Yeah, exactly. Because you remember it because mm-hmm. it was traumatic. I'm yeah. not going to forget. No, never. You know, and that's where I was, and I found out. Yeah. And. S- I mean, literally, like what? The next day. The next the, no, day. The next day, I was on a plane. Mm-hmm. You know, headed out to you know Kenya, and then you know, I mean, and then also it was December in Kenya, and December in Kenya is so the holidays here and the holidays there, totally different thing. Here, like you know, things continue to happen, like work, blah blah blah. There, it's like everything comes to a standstill. Really? Pretty much. Oh yeah. Like I mean, you know, businesses still operate for the like you know. A lot of things still are still happening, uh-huh. but in a big way, it's it's kind of scaled back. Yeah, I wish. And I think it used to be like that here. It's, it's like it a was. weekend. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. like it's a real holiday. It, yeah, yeah. It's like almost to. almost the whole month, and yeah. so it's just completely bananas, man. Like people are shopping, and then people are trying to go out of town, hmm. and all this stuff. So it, going back home in in December is usually hectic on its own. This yeah. time it was ad- the added, you know, just throw the the whole, you know, fact that we're going there, to, you know, to rest my grandpa, to pe- mm-hmm. you know, to rest. <sighs> it was draining. It was draining. But I definitely want mm-hmm. to, you know, I, I definitely um, want to, you know, thank, you know, just the family, you know, everyone for coming together. It was such a beautiful ceremony. It was it was it was it was as beautiful a time as we could spend, you know, laying him to rest. You know, and I'm and I'm really, really grateful for that. I mean, the weather was good. I mean, hmm. everything really came together. Yeah. You know. So, with that, um, who wants to go next? Well, I will tell my story next. Okay. Tell us. So my mother uh, passed away in 2007 uh, from a form of uh, leukemia called myelodysplasia. Uh huh. She had always had somewhat of poor health. Um, And she developed a condition in her early 20s that affected her platelets. And the medication that she had to take for it, they told her would eventually cause her to develop uh, leukemia. And I had known this since I was a teenager. I was under the impression that it would happen in her 70s or 80s, but it happened in her 50s. And there were times when her uh, syndrome went into remission and so there was some hope that this wouldn't actually happen but it did um, eventually happen and uh, it was in early 2006 mid 2006 around there when her condition developed into full-blown myelodysplasia uh, leukemia I always say leukemia because it's hard to explain to people but really, myelodysplasia has to do with the formation of your platelets in your bone marrow. Okay. And at that point, it was just me and her. So she had been widowed. She'd remarried. She'd divorced. Um, I lived with her. I went to school. But mainly, my life consisted of uh, partying and being a waiter. I didn't have a lot of direction. I'd been to school, but I didn't finish. And yeah, my life just really had no direction. Mm-hmm. But I was living with her, and it it was really good because I was able to you know carry in the groceries and do uh, work around the house, and right. um, it was an effective uh, a situation. 
However, that all changed when she got sick. And we had some extended family, but no one that lived very close. And I became the primary caregiver. Uh. So I quit my job. And she had to take a leave of absence from her job. But she actually worked for a hospital. She was a nurse. And she had very good insurance. And so we were able to survive just off of the uh, insurance payments. And uh, so I stayed full time. And there were a lot of... uh, a lot of doctor's appointments and a lot of um, driving. Okay. So it was a full-time job. And right. she was sick enough to where, you know, I had to help her down the hall because if she accidentally fell and started bleeding internally, mm-hmm. you know, it was uh, it was a very scary time. And she ended up going through uh, chemotherapy and um, ultimately uh, developed uh, sepsis in very late uh, November of 2007 and passed away. And for me, though, when I when I look back on it, because I have the, the benefit of it being, you know, roughly 12 years now, right? Well, 11. Yeah. Uh, roughly 11 years since it happened. And my life, I am a completely different person than I was then. And I find it interesting when I think back on that time, how I reacted to the news. Mm-hmm. Because when I was told, it was like I didn't miss a beat. Um, I almost, I felt bad because I didn't feel that bad. I I just just went, I was like, okay, well, what are we going to do? So I'm going to have to quit my job, and I'll be the primary caregiver, and I will take care of everything, and I got this. But what really happened was I didn't deal with any of those feelings and they all expressed themselves as anger. Mm. So for instance, I had never had a problem with road rage. I had, I had some angry moments. I mean, I had some issues with alcohol and, um, my life wasn't exactly perfect and I wasn't by no means anywhere near a saint, but I didn't have a, a true rage problem. Uh, like, like I developed, since then so like i would be driving her all the time to places and and just really becoming offended at the slightest offense that anybody would do um i couldn't you know i couldn't date during that time because i was just kind of an angry guy right and the strange thing was my mind fooled me into thinking that it was completely rational right so i didn't think that um i had any issues I didn't think that I was acting irrationally. And even my, my mom and I's relationship, um, you know, there were several arguments because I was trying to be very protective and I, I wanted her to, to eat a certain way and to take care of herself a certain way. But she is a full-grown woman and I can't, couldn't make her eat certain things or eat healthier, and, although she did her best. And right. so um, – Basically, I was kind of a jerk a lot of the times and, and not meaning to. And my mom was well taken care of. I mean, it was – she smoked cigarettes. And I, I remember um, she, because of the medication she was on, she would wake up in the in the middle of the night and my room was down the hall from hers. And if I heard the lighter go off, it's like I would wake up. Like I was on high alert for, mm. for like a year and a half because I knew that what probably would happen would be she would light the cigarette – and then she would fall asleep, and I can't tell you how many uh, how many times I I would walk in there, and you know take the cigarette out of her hand and put it out, and and that that was just the routine, right? You know, was me just being on high alert, and that is uh, a dangerous place to be for that long, and the hospital and the clinics that we would go to they would always offer counseling, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're from Texas and just the environment we were raised in. We didn't really feel like we needed it. I I was like, well, I'm fine. And and she's like, well, you know, I'm fine. Neither of us were fine, right? We were dealing with uh, life and death issues, and it was kind of just us. And we were just not dealing with anything, not dealing with those emotions. And I became, like I said, you know, very angry, although I was getting stuff done. And ultimately, I was completely unprepared for when she passed away. Um, I mean, I'll never forget because I remember the very, like, you know how you remember things like that. And I remember the last time when we had a real conversation we were at Walgreens, she was picking up a prescription Mm -hmm. and then she just, she didn't wake up the next day and I had to rush to the hospital. 
and she had got sepsis because her immune system, we were waiting for a, um, a, a bone marrow transplant. But as, as you know, Doris, um, they, yes. won't, they won't let you get that transplant until your, your liver function and your kidney functions are at a certain place because it can ki- the, the transplant itself can kill you because you have to like basically completely take away your immune system and try to replace it. Absolutely, yes. And, and so we were waiting for her kidney functions, but she had a lot of health issues. Mm-hmm. And so her kidney functions just wouldn't really get to the right place. And eventually um, it was just like, you know, she caught a cold and, that was, and it got to her blood and that was, you know, that was it. And I remember being at the hospital, and I think the most difficult thing that I've ever been through was I was the only child. And so I was the only one that could make a decision to end life support. And I remember these three doctors, they had a consultation, and one of them called me, and it was like 7 in the morning, and he was just like, you have to make this decision. It's like, I cannot tell you what to do, but here's what's going to happen if you don't make a decision. And eventually she had, like, pneumonia. She was going to drown in her own her own fluids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so... I had to make that decision, and I and I did it. And the family was there; the whole family was there when it when it happened, and it was it went as well as it possibly could have. And the funeral was a couple of days later, which just happened to be on my birthday. Um, but you know that's when it rolled, and I didn't want everybody to change their schedule. And so we had the funeral; it was a wonderful service. Like I said, it, it is surprising how many people. She was such a a loving and caring woman. How many people came out? And, uh, you know, we had the service and, and life went on and I was able to settle her accounts and do all the things that I was supposed to do. I actually held it together pretty well. Uh-huh. Looking back at it though, because I had not processed anything that had happened, I completely yes. just buried it and eventually ended up, uh, deeper in my personal issues with addiction because of it. And ultimately it, had a degrading effect on my mental well-being where I stayed in the same house that we were at, I inherited the house, I, I had some money. And it's so funny to me that, you know, at the worst possible time of your life, somebody's like, here's a check for a whole bunch of money and you're on your own. And I don't know if it's a function of the American health college system because I, I know you talked about having family and stuff. Yeah. What I, what I f- thought was weird was, and I think it's an insurance issue, was all the doctors and all the nurses that I had known really well, because we went to the same place every week, um, several times a week, all of them would just stop talking. So the people I had come to depend on for advice mm-hmm. and that I would call and ask, okay, she's having this symptom, what should we do? All those people just cut off communication. I didn't get a, I'm sorry for your loss or anything. Wow. And, and I understand now that that's an insurance thing because so many people sue. Um, the only really, really awesome thing was, uh, I remember getting the bill and there was no bill. Like they, it was tens of thousands of dollars and the hospital just said they didn't charge at all because she had worked in this hospital system for most of her adult life. Okay. And, and so everybody knew her in the hospital. And so, um, you know, I was able to, to make it through that, but ultimately it led me to a place where not dealing with my emotions um, caused me to just go deeper and deeper into addiction. I had a bunch of money. I was just useless. I couldn't move on with my life. Right. And fortunately, I it got so bad that I lost the house, you know, and I had to move to Colorado and, you know, try to deal with it there. And I really didn't deal with it until about two years ago. I didn't really begin to deal with it until I got to Colorado and was involved in some programs and really began to discuss this for the first time from a perspective of let's really look at what's happening. And and you know what's funny is even this morning, uh-huh. even last night, I was experiencing some anger issues and, and I now I know to like examine my feelings. And really, because it's, it's never, at least for me, it's, well, rarely, is it the issue? Not when I'm actually angry. Like if I'm annoyed or something, then 
somebody else might be the cause of that. But usually, it's something going on in me. It's an underlying issue. Yeah, it yeah, lays yeah. within. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I got most of us. Yeah, really. yeah most people. Mm-hmm. That's, that's why I, do, I, I try not, I, t- I don't take things, I don't make it about me immediately until that person's like, you. And even then, <laughs> you know, if it makes sense, then I'm like, okay, cool. But if it doesn't, I'm just like, yeah. I, I don't know what's going on. But, but if you, you know, I can help you out if you, you know, you let yeah. me. But otherwise... You know, I don't take it personally. Yeah, especially so in I the get, field that we work in. Yeah, ex- ex- well, exactly. And, and the gentlemen that w- that we see on a daily basis, and and they get upset at us, and we realize that it's not it's not us, it's them. Right. I realized that I was trying to develop a reason to not come and say this, right? Because I didn't want to write the the blog post. I didn't really want to talk about it because it's painful to remember those things. Yeah. But it's also crucial. I've learned to deal with feelings. Uh, to allow myself the space to to grieve sometimes mm-hmm. and to know, like you said, that everything that she was and that she taught me is still there, right? Yeah. And even though uh, I was not uh, the greatest son, I did what I was supposed to do in the best that I could at the time, right? right? I don't somehow, and uh, <laughs> as you continue to listen to this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, you will come to understand that at one point in my life, I was a ferocious drunk. <laughs> And and so I mean a violent drinker, just, just awful. Like me and alcohol. I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, I no. can't even imagine. Let, let, let me yeah. just clarify. He wasn't violent. He just drunk violently. Yes, like, exactly. Know, we, yeah, I wasn't actually that violent, but yes, yeah. drank violently. Violence to myself. Yeah, you know? exactly. So much so that at the end of my drinking career, I could not even have a beer without waking up two weeks later in a hospital. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Some but br- at that br- point, Bruce Banner type thing. Yeah, you just black out and you <laughs> it was crazy, and yeah. and I became crazy. And but through providence and and help from a higher power or or whatever it was, something allowed me to to not have a drink for a year and a half while she was ill. I was like, that was off the table. Now, admittedly, in the recovery community, I was definitely a dry drunk. Right, I was not dealing with my emotions. I wasn't processing things. But I was, you know, getting her her medication. I was taking care of her. I was doing the things that I was supposed to do. And, and all of that came from what she had taught me um, as, a, as a child and raised me with some very good values that uh, now, when I've progressed in my journey and, and been able to, to deal with uh, my life and look at it and process it with the help of some very fine people along the way, um, are really shining through, right? So I, I know wherever she's at, just like your grandfather, wherever they're at, they're extremely proud of what we're doing today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, and and I kind of hesitated because when I was writing the content, you know, at some point I paused because I was writing something about how I feel that my grand grandfather would be proud of, you know, what I'm doing and who I've become. You know, but I paused because I didn't know this for certain because it's not something that was said. Um, mm. Because you know, as we'll find out soon, there was a period uh, when during his illness where he wasn't speaking anymore. Yes, and the communication, you know, just wasn't as it had been in the past. Yeah, um, which was incredibly, incredibly, you know, sad to, you know, have to experience, you know, that part of things. Yes, I can imagine. I know for me. It was, I don't want to say lucky, but I didn't have any clue how dire the situation was until she didn't wake up that day. And um, she was herself all the way, you know, through to just when when things just fell off a cliff. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't, even though she became sick from the chemotherapy, they were able to find a a pill um, that was able to control the... the, um, what do you call it? The stomach upset. Mm-hmm. And she was able to, to function relatively normally. Like she couldn't go back to work, but she did work from home a lot. Mm-hmm. And she was able, her quality of life was, was very good throughout most of her sickness. And, nice. and she at least, you know, had that. And for her, and I, and I came to find out later that she had always known that this was about the age when this was going to happen. So she had mentally prepared herself for a long time. Like she knew what was coming. But, again, she did kind of spare me from that. Like, I, I always thought when she said it, when she got older, that it was like 70s or 80s. But when I did get to speak with her about it, uh, she always knew it was going to be, because they had told her about, you know, 20 to 25 years from the time that she started taking this pill. Yeah. 
the pill itself, which is the cure for your current illness, is going to give you cancer. So, you know, it must take an amazing amount of courage, and you know, I don't even know what. I mean, to to know that that's where things are headed, and mm-hmm. actually live as a decent person, because you have a choice. You can, you know. Because, I mean, there's all kinds of movies and stuff where they're like, okay, so so if you know this is how much time you have, what, you know, yeah. you know they have this whole, all these narratives about what people do, right? Yeah. Yes. And they just go crazy, uh-huh. right? <laughs> right. So everyone has a choice, you know, so to, you know, to choose to be a decent person the whole time, you know, you know, and not wavering. No, she was uh, always a decent person. I, I kind of think, um, I don't even, I'm sure she did some things wrong, but not a lot. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, yeah. you know, she, she, she didn't decide at some point to be like, all right, no, cool, just, let's let the darkness take over for a while. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know? Yes. You know, she, and, she and let's amazing. just do whatever. Yeah, no, you know? not not at all. And if it weren't for her being who she is, I think I would have turned out uh, much differently. And she just loved to take care of things, and I was one of them. You know, she had a garden, and she was always growing something. We had five dogs. Yeah. Um that I inherited that. That's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, Those stories thoughts. are interesting too. <laughs> They're so funny. Yeah. You know, but, but I can definitely see that in you, Aaron, though, you know, because, uh, you know, we work together and I can tell how, you know, you were taken care of, you know, you try and take care of our guys, you know, in the same way. Now, that's not always the best thing, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're, you know, in, if you're in a moment where you're trying to reprimand something, someone for doing something that they knew was wrong and you're apologizing to them as you're doing it. <laughs> that is my mom, by the way. That is, you know, did you I, just call Aaron out? <laughs> he did, but that Listen, was so funny. Here's I'll, funny. I'll call him out. I called him out already before. This oh, isn't yeah. the first time we've talked. No, we have. I talked called about him out. I was in the office, and one of our people. This happened in front of me. Yeah. And, and as, I was like, I'm sorry, as it was I have to do this. I was like, Why are you apologizing, man? <laughs> but you know, that is so funny because that's my mom. So there's a there's I a get funny it. there's a funny little story. So <laughs> my mother loved uh, a certain shade of pink, but not like bright pink and when they asked the funeral home what kind of uh, makeup would you like would she have liked and I, and I told them pink but I wasn't very specific <laughs> <laughs> and so when I went to view the body when they had um, done all the things that they do the shade of lipstick that they had on her was pink mm-hmm. but it was one that she would have hated <laughs> <laughs> however in the true spirit of my mother she would rather have worn pink lipstick than tell somebody like no I don't like this and Please, you're gonna have to redo it. She would have right, been like, "No, right, they tried their right. heart. They tried their best. They did their best. That and is, we'll just that deal is with it. so you." Yeah, and that's her. <laughs> I get all that from her. And and yes, there there are some times like I've had to learn to be more assertive. And and it's funny when I encounter that, and I realize it's not always the best approach, but it is the approach I was raised with, mm-hmm. and it's always a loving approach. But yes, you're yes. right. At a certain point. When you're dealing with these guys, and, and and for me, it was who I was dealing with in particular. Sometimes I, I think you got to be harder, sometimes softer. In the way, this is a debate that we have constantly. This, yeah, this is, um, yeah. But it, it is, you know, I, I I err on the side of kindness. And, and that's why my transition into a raging, crazy maniac for a while in my life was such a strange one. And how I know that it was me not dealing. Because now that I've dealt with a lot of it, mm-hmm. I'm who I was to begin with and people say, well, I can't see that in you, but it was no, once in a while a it rears time. its he- ugly head. Like last night, <laughs> last night I was like, well, just like we discussed, I was like, you know what? Yeah. Something must be up. Yeah. And it was this. There's nothing, there was nothing rational about what happened. So, th- so let me just qu- real quick before we transition. <laughs> oh, no. So, so I'm going to bed and I'm about to like open my, my, my door and I hear, Something I don't know if you know. I couldn't tell if it was. Season. Was it? Were you watching political stuff? Well, what had happened was I had fallen asleep watching YouTube videos on my TV. Okay. And and just like here, since they're they're not uh, broadcast quality, it's not like all the same volume. Yeah. And what had happened, I think, was as one video went off, it just automatically played a different one because I didn't even know what it was playing. Right. And the volume on that one was totally different because my TV volume hadn't changed, and it wasn't very loud. But you're right. My reaction. So you called me, and and my reaction was just like I, I was so mad, and I couldn't get back to sleep, and then I had weird dreams. But it was interesting because, like I said, this morning when I was writing this stuff down, when I was getting prepared for tonight's show, 
it, it struck me why that was. I was like, oh, uh. that's why I was upset. It had absolutely, like, it could have been anything. It could have been me going to the bathroom and stubbing my toe. Uh, it could have been <laughs> one of the guys left a coffee cup out. Something was going to sort of cause that reaction because I wasn't really thinking about how difficult it was going to be to do this and accepting <laughs> of that difficulty. When I accept my feelings for what they are, everything's fine. When I try to run from them, they show up as anger. Yeah, because, man, I was like, because, cause, okay, so you, I was, so in my mind, I was like, yo, he's sleepy. He doesn't, I don't think he knows exactly what he's doing. He's just, you no. Know, he's, he's, he's like, you know, Mr. Krabby Pants, I'm sleepy. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm already in Krabby Pants mode, right? So, so what happened was, so I called because I realized that it's not like you're trying to be, you know, just completely no i know, had no idea yeah just you know mean and you know it's not like you know you're just not you know you're, you're just trying to be bad and not care about what's going on around you you fell asleep mm-hmm. i know you fa- <laughs> i know you fall asleep with you know something yeah, you we know, talked playing. about this yeah yeah usually it's c-span but this time it was like a youtube video i couldn't tell what it was but what i could tell from the minute i came up the stairs was yo this is loud right okay and so at first first i thought to myself there's no way he's asleep with that going on. <laughs> and so then I then I, I was like, okay, fine. I, I don't want to knock on your door. So I was like, okay, so if he is awake, then he'll just hear, you know, the phone and, you know, and, and pick it up and I can, you know, just be like, hey, man, would you turn it down on a scotch or whatever? <laughs> I call <laughs> and uh, what I hear is, hello? Hey, hey, Aaron, um, your TV is super loud. Exactly what I said. What? <laughs> hey, man, your, your, your TV is super loud. And then it went quiet. And I didn't know exactly what was going on. I just figured, like, you know, maybe we're having some reception issues. <laughs> and so I figured he had heard what I said, so I hung up. So I hung up, and then, it, then, I, then I realized that I shouldn't be as relaxed as I <laughs> should be. <laughs> because what, what I hear next is his door open. And he's just slamming doors. I don't even know how you can slam doors. Your door has a, like a self-closing it, it, mechanism on it. So it sounded like his door slammed and then he went to the bathroom and that door sounded like it slammed. <laughs> and there was just, you know, those short, stumpy, you know, steps. Just <laughs> pop, pop, pop. <laughs> yeah, I'm angry. You know, and that's what I'm hearing, right? Oh, and man, I'm and so then, sorry. and then, no, no, no. This is, this is the money right here. So he comes back to his room and before he walks in, he stops at his door and I kid you not, he said, he said, oh, it's like, I don't know. What did I say? I, I don't think, even. I, th- I, think, I think you said something like, oh, I'll show you loud. Because, <laughs> what, because, <laughs> I, remember, I kid you not. I, I turned the volume up, didn't I? He turned the volume up. Because he had turned it down and then he turned it like up, like, actually you turned it up to just about where it was. Yeah. Was anyway. it, was, it wasn't like poking the bear too hard. You know, so he turned it up to where it was anyway when I before I called him, mm-hmm. and I was just I was just in there. I was like, okay, man. So should I? <laughs> you know, should I? Maybe not. Should, should I like hide in a corner mm-hmm. or, like, or like I'm not sure what to expect <laughs> because, like, like I said, you know, most people can't tell that he has that side to him, and so I knew something. You know, I was I was really concerned. No, it was this. It was so funny. I was concerned. I I, I like. I don't know really what happened. Like as soon as you said something, it was just like, like I just I like lost my mind for a minute, and it wasn't until this morning like I woke up and I was just like in this horrible mood and I'm like, you know what am I gonna do and and blah 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 and this and that and I'm you know and and it wasn't until because I knew what I had to do today. Right? Yeah. I knew what I was gonna do this morning, which was sit down and write and and I hopefully all of you who are listening will will read the blog post because it explains a lot more about what was going on. Yeah. And and I knew I had to write that this morning. And I really haven't revisited those issues in quite some time except in some therapy. And it was my it was me dealing with that, which is ultimately, you know, it lets me know that I needed to deal with it. Right. Because it's like it's funny because I, w- I was telling you earlier, I was watching this um um yeah, this show and it was talking about why things come up, right? And like, we talked we touch a little bit on this, you know. Things sort of happen for a reason, and I know that's a lot of uh, a lot of issues we don't want to get into. But anyway, when things come up, it's your opportunity to deal with them. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And we, what we've learned about mental health, at least for me, and I know you know too, is if you don't deal with them, 
and you just shove it back down there and pretend like it didn't happen, it's going to come back, and it's going to come back worse. Yep. And so as much as I've done of the grieving process and as, as much as I've been through and, and dealt with all that, there was still something there. And what's great is right now, as I'm doing this, as we're doing this, as we're going through this process and this journey, it's cathartic, meaning we are getting stuff out that we need to get out. We're healing and we're we're allowing other people to like see that healing process as we do it. And hopefully, hopefully there's somebody out there that it can help. Like, cause if you're dealing with this and if, if I can just, as I, as I move on and, and pass the baton, let me just say that if you're dealing with a loved one with cancer, if you are a primary caregiver, it is okay to be overwhelmed. Like if that's one thing that I could take, like for me at that time, it wasn't okay to be overwhelmed. And that's why I didn't deal with it. It's okay to be overwhelmed. And it's okay to say, I can't do this by myself. Will you please help me? It's okay to say, I'm not feeling anything. And I don't understand why I'm not feeling anything. Because a competent counselor will lead you through the process to allow you to feel those feelings that you're suppressing. And you won't have to deal with them in a crazy way. Six, eight, uh, 10 months later, two years later, you'll be able to deal with them then with a trained professional because there are so many good people and so many techniques. It's not like it was 50 years ago. You don't just sit on a couch and tell yeah, somebody true. your story. There's actual evidence-based techniques, CBT, DBT, that can help people. And so I just urge you because cancer and, and disease and death, they touch all our lives. And so I want to urge people to, to be proactive and to admit that they need help and to get some help. There is no shame in that game. No, there's definitely no shame. And, you know, no. I think specifically I'd like to just say that, you know, for, for, for men to speak about yes. things that have to do with emotions and, you know, you know, mental health, you know, there's all kinds of things. You know, some people will say that, you know, it shows weakness. And that's probably why it doesn't happen as often. But mm-hmm. I don't think that's the truth. It's not the truth. It's not the truth. It's you know? strength. Um, absolutely. Our emotions and our emotions, feeling and having emotions are a part of our strength. Yes. You know. It's what makes us human. It's what makes us human. Yeah. And dealing with them is what allows us to be a better human. And I sort of, I look at it because I was in a Texas. It was kind of a, a macho thing for me to, to not, no, I don't feel these things. But when I look at it now, everyone has a team. Like you talked about team sports. Yeah. And, and, uh, and number two, and being a part of a team means you play a role. But when you're dealing with this stuff, have a team. Yeah. Have a counselor, have a friend, have have uh, a team of people to help you deal with this. And Because, you know, the greatest quarterback alive cannot um throw a pass to, to somebody who's out there he just can't do it right <laughs> exactly and don't try to do it by yourself seek some help hey you know what and that's why we're here too we have a website feel free to contact us on the second part of this we're going to be talking more about resources as we talk more about cancer in general and you know feel free to reach out you know that's what we do for a living yeah. is, is we help people and we don't want anyone to feel like they're alone yeah and, absolutely you know that's what we're here for yeah Definitely, yeah. Right, so, th- you know, thank you for listening. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I've become so comfortable just listening to you guys. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> anyway, so like Aaron said, this was really, really hard for me also. I danced around it, went in circles, and ended up doing a wonderful PowerPoint of the next topic next week. <laughs> I said I'd start, <laughs> you know, how you get I a... I saw that coming. <laughs> yes. When you get a... When you start a book by reading the last page. So I thought, okay, let me work on next week's uh, podcast. Mm-hmm. And in that way... Um, I can uh, spend the last minutes working on today's podcast. And then by the time I actually got here to the studio, um, I think uh, Adrian knew, had anticipated my move. So he asked me a few questions and knew I wasn't ready. Yeah. So I started answering the questions one by one. But I I kept starting with he. I was talking about my father's feelings and I was not allowing myself to start any sentence with I. 
Yeah, it's so interesting. So that was very, very interesting because even when I got better at it, because it took like almost one hour for Adrian to prepare me. And at one point I wanted to say to him, I, I cannot do this. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. That I don't want to do this because I don't know where to start. So the similar, a similar thing happened when my dad passed away. I was not able to write a tribute. I just got stuck. My brain froze and I couldn't write a tribute. I had so much to say and I just couldn't, I couldn't write because I felt so much. Mm. Everything I wanted to say was so deep. I knew how to feel it, but I really didn't know how to take it from my soul and put it on paper. Yeah. So my elder sister, Bella, wrote a short tribute uh, from the both of us. Anyhow, um, so the last time I, before my dad was diagnosed in uh, December 2013, I had, the last time I had seen him was uh, 2012 at his uh, and mom's 50th <laughs> wedding anniversary. He was at his best, at his, oh my goodness, <laughs> that is what preceded his illness, which of course, by God's design, um, was perfect. Yeah. So when he was diagnosed with uh, esophageal cancer, I knew th that my fears had been confirmed because he had had all the symptoms. Yeah. I remember when he would visit the U.S. where Adrian and I live, he would shop for Tums and eat them like candy. Mm. So his, um, his heartburn or an acid reflex was not being um, taken care of by the Tums because Tums is like a Band-Aid. Okay, it doesn't yeah. take care of the source of the problem. It's like a pacifier. It... Just uh, for a while there, you feel very good and you're ready to eat your next meal. But uh, it has a rebound effect. As it's uh, wearing off, the heartburn comes back with a vengeance. Mm. And you can actually taste the acid from your stomach in your mouth. Mm. So that, uh, that to me was very telling. Yeah, because you, that yeah. acid is what causes... Um, condition called called Barry's syndrome okay or or Barry's esophagus so it tears it inflames the lining of your esophagus mm -hmm. and um, then the c cells start to become abnormal and with time cancer grows there so mm -hmm. I had seen all those symptoms before um, and so that's why I say that my, f my worst fear was confirmed and I knew the journey ahead was going to be tough. Yeah. But you know, when it's somebody who's so dear to you, yeah. I was expecting this is going to be different. We've got this. Yeah. And, um, I was secretly hoping for a miracle despite the results from the CAT scan and the PET scans that confirmed um, the diagnosis. I was very, very, very sad that I couldn't be there with him when he left for treatment in India. Mm. I wanted to be present when he experienced his first adverse reaction to anything because I knew chemotherapy, radiation, yeah. in the beginning... It seems okay. But then with time, because um, uh, chemotherapy is cumulative. So it's just building in your body. It's, and, you know, slowly but surely causing havoc. Yeah. It's killing the good cells. It's killing the, the bad yeah. cells. It's, mm -hmm. you know. Doesn't discriminate, right. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um so unfortunately, I wasn't there, and I was very, 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 very sad that I wasn't able to be there. Um, he lost his voice after radiation therapy. So when I 
2014, I I got to Nairobi from the U.S. a month after he had been home from India, where he received chemotherapy and um, radiation therapy. He had lost his voice, and it was hard to communicate. He still was uh, very persistent. He tried, and he, he was talking. I mean, like forcing himself you know, through whispers. He's, I tried to ask him not to do that because that only gets, uh, makes your throat worse. But he, it just appeared that the more he felt like the more he tried, the better he would get. Yeah. You know, how do you know you've lost your voice if you don't try and talk? Right. right. You know, maybe it's come back. Right. So it, it was quite a struggle just watching him yeah. trying to communicate all through his uh, first adverse reaction to the treatment he was getting for the cancer. So at, uh, at one point, I was very afraid that I'd never, would never be able to talk again. Mm. That was not the case. He did get his voice back. It was hoarse. He had a persistent cough. And all this new diagnosis uh, with the cancer, he had also been diagnosed with emphysema. Mm. That was a totally new diagnosis. And uh, the radi- radiation does not, is, you know, radiation for head and neck cancers is, is, it's fragile because, you know, it's directed to one point, the, uh, it's directed to the tumor, but, you know, it hits other things. Uh, yeah. And then you end up... Um, you know, you end up with other problems that you didn't have before. Mm-hmm. Right. So his um, his vocal cords were paralyzed, and that was hard. That was very, very, very difficult. A persistent cough, just to watch him uh, getting, you know, fits of uh, coughing, and if he was eating, he would choke and it was really uncomfortable to watch i felt so sorry for him i felt so sorry for him and i felt so helpless being a nurse i I really felt that i could have i should have come up with something that would help him Mm. and he's persistently asked me how when am i going to get better when is this cough going to go and uh so he believes the more chemotherapy, he looked at chemotherapy as a cure. So that he thought the more chemotherapy he gets in radiation, the faster he would heal. But it was such a, that's a, it was terrible. Be, watching him being so strong for the chemo, and the chemo was really destroying him as it, dis, you know. Yeah. It had, it, mm-hmm. he wanted to have it because he wanted to be healed yeah but chemotherapy the side effects of the chemotherapy was so bad and um just watching him uh, broke my heart as yeah. he waited to heal all in all you know the, the the things that really really um put me in a bad place and lots of s- sadness uh, depression, or the fact that um, he was, I mean, his dignity really mattered. My dad took care of himself. He always said, cleanliness is next to godliness. He dressed well. I remember after he had passed during the church service, the pastor saying that how well he matched everything. He just ne- he carefully picked his clothes out for the day. So that the the his uh, body image changed mm. with the treatment, not being able to eat because the tumor was growing bigger. Mm-hmm. Despite the treatment, he lost a lot of weight, and seeing him looking so emancipated, you know, so anorexic, that was very, very, very saddening. Especially because I knew that it really bothered him. And he asked, you know, when am I going to put on weight? So the more he ate, 
um, the more he became uh, skinnier. Mm. He couldn't keep the food down. Yeah. He wanted so much to keep it down so that he could put on the weight and he could look good in clothes. But um, that wasn't happening uh, quick enough and that really, really depressed him. Mm. That really depressed him and it made me sad. It made me really, really, really sad. Um, so well, he went on to require a peg tube. So his feeding tube was supposed to, you know, take care of the nutrition. And uh, he was very excited uh, when the doctor said, well, this is going to help you put on weight. Yeah. And he said to me, you know, I this is the best thing that can happen. Yeah. I'm going to get all the nutrients that I need. So my body will be so strong. It was strong enough to fight this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, when, when uh, patients are talked to about having a, a, a feeding tube, they're not told, they're not counseled enough about how important it is to taste food. Hmm. Interesting. So the pleasure that he derived from eating just went away and he was so shocked because digestion starts in the mouth yes. and your saliva and mm-hmm. everything. So when you, you're receiving parenteral treatment, which is a fu- you know fu- tube feeding, it's not the same. It's not the same. No. Your stomach yeah. is struggling to digest because you're starting from halfway down your digestion. Right. right your, ge- yeah. your digestive tract. Yeah. And uh, so he had uh, worse reflux and uh, increased coughing and he got skinnier. So that didn't solve the problem. And uh, he repeatedly called me to ask me, you know, when he was going to feel better. I felt really, really bad not having a good answer for him. And uh, I gave him hope. I reassured him. I said, you know explain to him what he was going through but I couldn't tell him that um, you really are not going to go get go back to being normal right those were very difficult conversations I can imagine they were important but they were very difficult and me knowing what was coming next didn't make it easier for me no oh, yeah you know I would just, even if he was turning for the better and his symptoms, adverse reactions and symptoms were manageable, mm-hmm. I just knew what the next problem would be as the body was shutting down. Yeah. So towards the end, uh, when he ended up in hospital and he was uh, with sepsis. Yeah. Because, of course, he, his immunity was broken down. Yeah. He turned for the better. This is by the words of my family who was there with him. And uh, after they gave him some blood, they infused him also. They gave him uh, fluids Mm -hmm. and he was responsive. Before, when he went to hospital, he was not responsive. So he was responsive. And um, so I said, how is he doing today? And my mother said, oh, today he's doing very well. He's um, actually, they restrained him because he's f- pulling out the tubes and his IV lines, everything. And uh, so he's so strong. I think he's, he's uh, going to go home soon. That after being in for sepsis and the way organs shut down and this was after two days that yeah. he was doing that i knew that yeah. he was going through terminal agitation what's that before you actually start the dying process you go through terminal agitation nobody really knows what terminal agitation is Really? It's just that you're fighting, you're, res- yeah. you're 
most of the time you need a sitter so he had a nurse sitting by him just to watch him so mm. that he doesn't hurt himself and i call it the storm before the calm and when my mom talked to me about it and my sister i knew what was going on and uh, then they said that the doctors wanted to meet them in the morning right. so they i said you know what i am going to be part of that uh, meeting by conference i never got to be on the meeting because the doctor didn't show up in time he was 5 hours late and yeah. i had already gone to bed because yeah. of the time difference typical yeah. yes <laughs> so when the doctor when i called my mother My mom said, "Oh, they di- they discharged him. We're just waiting for the paperwork and we are taking home. The doctor said he's ready to go home." So I confirmed that he, you know, he was being sent home to pass away. Right. In my mind, I yeah, wasn't yeah. about to tell anybody. But um then I was very very sad, but I found myself very strong. I knew I had to prepare them because they didn't know what was coming and yeah. how I This is I can only compare it to when a woman is in labor and she's about to give birth and the baby's head crowns mm-hmm. at that point birth is imminent this head cannot go back right into the birth canal yeah. no You're, about death, to be baby, yeah there's a death yeah birth is imminent so death is also imminent yeah at that point And uh so of after a day after he got home talked to my mom I had already you know I talked to my sister Elizabeth because she's a nurse also and uh she knew what was going on so we were discussing about it and uh, we were preparing So mom calls me and she says oh he's really he's breathing really badly and I said when did he start oh just after I talked to you last night I said okay put the phone next to his f- ear I mean to his mouth and I heard how he was breathing and I said to her um he started his journey and uh you know just talk to him tell him how much you love him just remind him of the good memories stuff that you've shared together that's fun uh, ask the nurse to step aside and I said uh, in the text don't be scared and I called my sisters and I said Mom's alone, dad's passing. Why don't you go back home? And um and they did. And that was like maybe 45 minutes after when my first sister got there and he was still warm. He had just passed. Mm. And he looked so good. Mom sent way. me a picture and he looked, you know, I think life life and disease really wear us down he had uh, his skin looked bright hmm. his he looked just like something had been removed all the hardship all the pain and he was glowing yeah. and he was hadn't even passed away at this point hmm. when mom i said ma, to mom take a picture and send it so i saw him and i just and i knew he had that And I said touch his chest, touch his feet. His feet were cold, his hands were cold, his uh, stomach and chest were warm. So what happens? Blood mm-hmm. goes and uh, keeps the um vital organs. Right. You know, running. So um, So so I have a question. So how were you feeling through that process? I was We've not what sh- I was not feeling anything. I yeah. was feeling um i was in the mode of making sure that everybody is where they need to be and you know mom is taken care of she's not witnessing the passing i was in a mode that i obviously don't understand because it's not yeah. every day that your father passes sure. i've been yeah, around yeah. during numerous um passings my patients have you know That's yeah. something that I've experienced a lot, but a parent is is uh, different. different. So I was totally just I never got into I never shed a tear. I kept thinking because I, I was very very proactive and and then I called my 
No, I text my sister-in-law, who's a doctor, and I said, would you just uh, assess mom for some Valium? I know she's taken Valium before um, in when she was a young woman and because of her blood pressure. So that stuck in my head. So I know she's not allergic to that medication uh, because I wanted her to get a night of sleep yeah. after all this yeah. oh. crazy time. So... And I was good up to then. Arrange travel arrangement, you know, yeah, travel yeah. for my for us. I ended up uh, not traveling until the end, when Adrian and Liz had left. That I'll tell you about the moment when I experienced the loss. I ex- when my sister left on on uh, Wednesday night. I couldn't go with her because I'd lost, I couldn't find my passport. I remember hearing about that. And uh, so she went home, packed her stuff, came back to my place and left from there. The minute I shut the door behind her and I was left alone, yeah. all of a sudden I couldn't think, I couldn't do anything and I crashed. Yeah. I just crashed. I had no strength. I couldn't stop crying. Mm-hmm. And that's when it hit me that how alone I was. Mm. And I, so, you know, I, I, I had to really, really pull myself together, a lot of prayer, so that I'm able to get another passport, be able to travel. So I was all by myself. I did all that and um, ended up in Kenya. But mm-hmm. I believe everything happens for a reason. I was not supposed to be there. I'm not very good at uh, communal grieving. Yeah. So I got the opportunity to grieve by myself mm-hmm. and to be able to function when I got home to Nairobi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting how things Yes, so um, yes, it it was a, it was very very tough. The other toughest time was uh, begging my dad to stop chemo because mm. I could see it was going to kill him, mm. and you you know, and telling him at the same time that if he decides that he's not going to stop, I'm still going to support him. So finally, when he stopped the chemo, and um, just what it did, it just delayed symptoms. Mm-hmm. But it, when you stop chemo, you don't really stop the chemotherapy. Because it's still there. It's still there. It's building in your yeah. blood. Mm-hmm. So, um, yes, it's, it's, this is the first time I've really talked about it. And I c- there are certain things that I can't even I feel, but I can't talk about because of uh, we were very, very close, and I was able to just tell how emo- how he was emotionally hmm. broken. Yeah, and that's hard. That's hard to deal with. Hmm. That's hard to deal with, and the fact that I couldn't do anything, I was hopeless. Yeah. I felt hopeless and well, I just couldn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah, there's a real feeling of powerlessness. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I only attribute the fact that, you know, I was so much like him in that, uh, you know, as a leader, you know, he always felt that uh, it was more, it was in, important to try and, you know, keep it together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um you know, but still, you know, one thing I definitely remember was trying to make an effort to, you know, kind of reminding myself, like, listen, man, you know, you have to grieve, you know, because I know too all too well that nothing comes out of, you know, not going through that process at all. Right. You know, burying things. It works for it can work, but I don't know if it's the ideal choice. No. You know. It definitely isn't the ideal choice, you know. So it's effective for some people short term, but it's. I don't know if it's a yeah. sustainable way of, you know, coping with things. Yeah, it, it is so interesting because uh, Doris, you you said something that reminded me of what I experienced, which is 
for a while I didn't feel anything. Like I didn't, I, I did, I left the hospital and I was able like by bearing it to take care of the things I needed to take care of. Right. Um, uh, the will and, and the estate and all the legal stuff that happens when somebody passes away. And, and then as soon as that was done, bam, you know? Yeah. Um, and I wonder if that's some kind of like, I think it's a self-defense, an internal. Yeah. I mean, survival. Yeah, yeah. Kind of a, a survival, uh, inbuilt survival mechanism. But right? you have to deal mm-hmm. with it eventually, you know, and I know for, uh, both for both of you, this is, this is a pretty recent thing. And, um, you know, as you go along, I, you know, it's so good to talk about it because every time that we do discuss our feelings and sort of we re-examine them in our, in our heads and we make new connections. Yeah. And, and we're able to deal with them more effectively. And even, yeah. even at 11 years for me, you know, like I know, I know when you talk about how close, because for many years it was just me and my mom. Mm-hmm. And so we were, we were very close. And just as time has gone on, you know, every time I discuss it and every time I deal with it, you know, a little bit more gets healed and I'm able to see it from a, from a different perspective. Right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that was powerful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad that we did this, you know, um, you know, selfishly, I'm I'm really, really happy, you know, to, you know, see my mother, you know, speak about this because it may not have happened, at, you know, maybe not like this, you know. I mean, she spoke for a, a decent amount of time and it may not be everything, you know, that she needs to process, you know, th- that, but it's something. Yeah. And I'm happy for that. I'm happy to uh, for us to all have the opportunity to do this. Yeah, I'm also glad that we were able to have this discussion very candidly because, you know, when Adrian and I sit across from each other, none of us is going to bring up the topic in that way. Right. And I think the earlier it comes out or starts to come out, Mm -hmm. all the feelings start to come out, then you know for sure that you're headed for total recovery. Yeah. Right. So there's a burden that's just lifted. Yeah. And I must say that uh, most of the time when I think about dad, it's bittersweet because I know I didn't want to see him suffering, Mm -hmm. but I don't know when I'm ever going to get used to not having him around, Mm -hmm. especially just going to Nairobi or just texting him or just occasions where I know he'd be very proud and that he would love to experience. So I experience them and talk about them, that this is how. Usually I'll refer to, I'll say to Adrian, this is how Wuka would have loved this Mm -hmm. and he'd have been proud of you. And I tell my little sister Liz, I say, this is the kind of um, event or this is this is the kind of place and this is you know this is what he would say this is what he would feel about it this is I just make I, I just keep his spirit alive it's his spirit is totally alive in me oh, yeah, I just miss oh, yeah. the, the the physical yes. but I'm I can't be that selfish to miss the the physical when he's his physical being suffered. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's really well said. Um, yeah. You know, really after we've had this discussion, I just hope other people will be able to, you know, maybe it'll give someone else the courage or, you know, the thought to, you know, engage in this kind of discussion with, you know, one of the loved ones, a friend, yes. you know, whatever it is, you know, cause those dis- uh, discussions are important to have. They're vital. They're vital. They're vital. They're absolutely vital, mm-hmm. you know. And so, you know, with that, um, in closing, you know, do you guys have anything you'd like to say real quick? Well, next time, uh, next time we'll be talking more clinically um, and we'll talk about questions to ask your doctor before starting treatment, um, what kind of attitude is encouraged when you're going through a terminal illness, um, specifically cancer, uh, questions to ask your doctor before a biopsy. Right. And, yeah. you know, 
more, so, more clinical yes, stuff, just yeah. we are not, we just, we, we want to share in a way that everybody can understand. We want this podcast to be um, a part of everybody. Anybody yeah. can jump in. We're not trying to sound uh, politically correct. We are not trying to sound like we know everything. Mm-hmm. We are on this journey together. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's well said. Yeah, it really is. That's yeah. definitely well said. So, yeah, so next week we're going to be taking more of a clinical look at, you know, cancer specifically. Um, you know, wh- what's can- what is cancer? You know, right. is, 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 is one of the questions. Uh, we're going to look at, you know, treatment, uh, traditional, alternative. Um, you know, we're going to give some resources and right. we're going to, ha- you know, discuss some other points. You know, what can you look for? Uh, preventative measures, you know, that kind sure. of thing. Yeah. You know, again, we're not trying to give, you know, all kinds of uh, information. That we're not going to dive too deep into it. No, just the basics, the fundamentals. The basics, the fundamentals. Yeah, it's, what it's what we do, you know. So hopefully uh, everyone will be able to tune in for that. Uh, if you'd like to find us, we are at 2teachone.com. That's n- the number 2, T-E-A-C-H, number 1, dot com. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, at T W O T E A C H O N E. Um, feel free to you know comment, Please. let us know how we're doing, engage us in you know, you know, we want to hear whatever from kind you. of yeah. conversation you know. Uh, we started this so we can you know create a community. Yes, and uh, we look forward to hearing from everyone. Uh, we're currently um, hosted by Hot Podbean. Um, you should be able to find our uh, podcast there. Um, soon we'll let you know exactly where else you can find the podcast, uh, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, and uh, all the other um, usual suspects, uh, so to speak. Uh, you should be able to find us there soon. We'll let you know uh, when that is going to be happening. So tune in uh, tune in again and uh, check us out on uh, our social media platforms. And with that, I think uh, we're going to end this one. All right, I think we're done. I'd like to thank everybody for their time. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we're not doctors. We're not, yes. you know, we're not trying to give anyone any, you know, advice, you know, it, it, medically or anything like that. These are just tips. We're just trying to share some of our experiences and what we know. Um, Experience, you know, strength, and hope. Exactly. Yeah. Give you a little foundation. Hopefully it can uh, help you in the future. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, yes, and uh, you can be ready and be sure that we're going to send you links to resources. There's a lot of resources out there. Yeah. And we are going to make sure that we share everything with you so that you can be empowered. Absolutely. We love you and please comment and um, we can do this together. That's right, Doris. Well said. Well said. Can't say it any better. With that, uh, I'd just like to say goodbye. Good night. Peace.